Well, hello everyone. Welcome again to our study of the parables of Jesus. And uh, in this session, we are going to study lesson number 26 in our syllabus. The title is Asking to Give. And uh, it's found on page 187 of our syllabus. Once again, I want to encourage everyone who is watching this, be it on DVD or on our Sum TV channel, to make sure that you get a copy of the syllabus at secretsunsealed.org. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you for your many blessings this day. We thank you for your love and your care for us. We thank you for your word. We ask that that word will speak to us now, and we thank you for answering our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's begin at the introduction. Uh, in fact, the parable that we're going to be studying is found in Luke chapter 11 and verses 5 through 8. So even though this passage is not in the syllabus, I'm going to begin by reading it and then we'll read the introductory uh, statement that we have here on page 187. Here's the parable. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, Lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So let's read the introduction. The parable we will study in our lesson today is very closely linked with the Lord's Prayer. In fact, the Lord's Prayer comes immediately before this parable. Uh, in fact, the parable illustrates what should be our attitude when we approach the Lord in prayer, as well as what we should do once the Lord has answered our prayer. Let's begin by taking a look at the historical context with, within which Jesus told this particular parable. So now we'll go to the subtitle, Historical Context. Where was Jesus immediately before he taught the disciples the Lord's Prayer? The answer is in Christ's Object Lessons, page 140, and also Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. Ellen White writes that Jesus was praying, seeming unconscious of their presence, he continued praying aloud. The hearts of the disciples were deeply moved. As he ceased praising, uh, praying rather, they exclaimed, Lord, teach us to pray. So Jesus had been uttering a prayer aloud, and the disciples were impressed with the prayer, so they said, We'd like to pray that way too. So they asked Jesus to teach them to pray. And then comes this parable and some practical applications after the parable. Number two, what did Jesus do immediately after he taught the disciples the Lord's Prayer? Christ's Object Lessons 140 states, Then in a parable, he illustrated the lesson he desired to teach them. So you'll notice that uh, he's praying. The disciples are impressed with his prayer. So now they say, teach us to pray. Jesus teaches them the Lord's Prayer. And then he gives the parable and what comes after the parable to teach them how to pray. Now let's notice the prayer life of Jesus, which of course is our model. This is page 187 at the bottom of the page. Number one, how did the prayer life of Jesus illustrate the principle he sought to teach in this parable? Christ's Object Lessons 139 Ellen White wrote, Christ was continually receiving from the Father that he might communicate to us. So in other words, Jesus received to give. And the title of our study is Asking to Give. Number two, which Bible text does Ellen White provide to corroborate her comment in the previous question? In other words, what Bible verse do we find where we are told that Jesus received and then he gave. Well, uh, John 14, verse 24 reads, The word which ye hear 
is not mine. Jesus is speaking. He says, the word that I speak is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. And then uh, Jesus says a little bit later on in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28, towards the end of his life, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. So the Father ministered to Jesus, and then Jesus ministered to us. Um, Jesus received from the Father, and he gave to us. What he gave was not his in the first place. It belonged to the Father. Asking to give, in other words. Let's go to number three on page 188. What does Ellen White tell us about the prayer life of Jesus? Christ's Object Lessons 139. From hours spent with God, he came forth morning by morning to bring the light of heaven to men. Daily he received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. So notice once again the central thought of this lesson. He spent hours uh, morning by morning with his father, and the light came to him, and then he gave the light to others. He received a daily portion of the Spirit, and the purpose was to give what he had received. Number four, which messianic prophecy does Ellen White quote to prove her point in the previous question? So Ellen White is always in harmony with scripture. So which scripture does Ellen White quote uh, to tell us uh, that Jesus received from his father to give to us? Isaiah 50 verse 4 is that verse. The Lord God has given me, and this is a messianic prophecy, the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakens me morning by morning. He wakens mine ear to hear as the learned. So Jesus heard from his father, and then Jesus shared what he had learned with others. So once again, Isaiah 50 verse 4 says, The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. So he receives from his father, and the purpose of receiving is so that he can impart or he can give. Now notice number five. What does the Gospel of Mark tell us about the habitual prayer life of Jesus? The answer is Mark 1.35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, that is before the sun came up, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed. So you'll notice here that Jesus would rise very early in the morning before the sun came up, and he would seek a solitary place where there were no distractions, and he prayed to his father. Let's notice number six. What does Ellen White say about the choreography of Christ's life? Uh, you know, everything in Christ's life had been planned from eternity past. And Jesus every day received instructions from his father about what he was supposed to do from day to day. Notice the, the answer to number six, the choreography of Christ's life. This um, is in the book Prayer, page 226. Christ in his life on earth made no plans for himself. He accepted God's plans for him. And day by day, the Father unfolded his plans. And then she, Ellen White writes about us. So should we depend upon God that our lives may be the simple outworking of his will. As we commit our ways to him, he will direct us our steps. So Jesus made no plans for himself. Day by day, the Father revealed his plans about what Jesus should do and what Jesus should say during that day. Uh, there's another statement that I want to read. It's not in the syllabus, but it's a very important statement. It's found in Desire of Ages, page 147. Uh, actually, everything that Jesus did on this earth had already been pre-planned in heaven. And Jesus on earth simply had to decide to go with the plan or not go with the plan. Praise the Lord. He decided to step by step, day by day, to follow the Father's plan that had been devised in the days of eternity. Desire of Ages 147. Uh, Ellen White is discussing here the expression that Jesus used frequently, 
mine hour is not yet come. Uh, here's the statement, I quote, the words mine hour is not yet come point to the fact that every act of Christ's life on earth was in fulfillment of the plan that existed from the days of eternity. Before he came to earth, the plan lay out before him perfect in all its details. So the plan was made in eternity. And uh, it says that before he came to earth, he saw the plan and it was perfect in all its details. Now you might say, well, then uh, on earth he knew everything that was in the plan when he was in heaven. No, he didn't. But Ellen White continues, as he walked among men, he was guided step by step by the Father's will. He did not hesitate to act at the appointed time. With the same submission, he waited until the time had come. So Jesus waited until that moment in the calendar that had existed from eternity came and then he decided to follow the plan that his father revealed to him from day to day. Let's go to number seven on page 188. What is one of the central lessons of this parable? Christ's object lessons has the answer, page 140. Here Christ represents the petitioner as asking that he might give. So the central thought is that we ask of the Lord so that we can give. We don't ask just for ourselves. It's with the purpose of sharing or imparting to others. Now let's go to the next section in uh, this lesson. The subtitle is Receiving to Give. Let's amplify that thought a little bit. Question number one, page 188 at uh, just below the middle of the page. What lesson did Jesus teach, seek to teach, his disciples when he fed the 5,000? What did Jesus want to teach his disciples by feeding the 5,000? Here's the answer in Christ's Object Lessons, page 140. They must receive spiritual food or they would have nothing to impart. See, Jesus broke the bread and gave the disciples the food and then the disciples gave the food to the multitude. They received in order to impart. So let's read the note. When Jesus fed the 5,000, he first multiplied the bread and fishes, thus providing an abundant supply of food. Jesus then gave the food to the disciples that they might impart it to the multitude. That is to say, they received Christ's abundant supply in order to give. And of course, this is not referring only to literal bread, which it was. It's referring to spiritual bread. They were to receive a spiritual supply of God's spiritual bread every day, but not keep it to themselves, but rather to impart it. Number two, what altruistic experience should characterize our prayers? Christ's Object Lessons, page 142, states, our prayers are not to be a selfish asking merely for our own benefit. We are to ask that we may give. So notice once again the same central theme. Our prayers are not to be a selfish asking merely for our own benefit. We are to ask that we may give. Now the next question is related to this. Number three at the bottom of page 188. How does John 7, 33 to 37 to 39, teach the same lesson about receiving and giving? Uh, you know, this is uh, during the Feast of Pentecost. And Jesus says, whoever thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And then he says that once we drink, out of our bellies will flow rivers of living waters to other people. It's kind of like the Samaritan woman. Jesus gave, them the, gave her the spiritual water, not the literal water, the H2O from Jacob's well, but gave her spiritual uh, uh, water, 
and as a result she received the water and the first thing that she does is go to the city of Sikar to her town and she goes from door to door and she announces that she has found the Messiah and she invites everyone in the city to come to listen to the words of Jesus. So she received salvation, she received the water, and immediately this woman imparted what she had received. That is receiving to give. Now let's read the note under question number three. This is at the top of page 189. When we come to Jesus, the source and fount of every spiritual blessing we, in turn, become fountains to others of those same blessings. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the moon. The moon receives the light from the sun, and then the moon projects the light to the earth. That's why Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He is this, like the sun. And he said also to his disciples, you are the light of the world. Uh, Jesus is like the sun, and the disciples are like the moon. Jesus shines on the disciples, and then the disciples are to project the light of Jesus to other people. They become witnesses of Christ, in other words. Now let's go to number four, page 189 still. Whom does the selfish neighbor in this uh, parable represent? Christ's Object Lessons, page 141. But the selfish neighbor in the parable does not represent the character of God because he answers the pleas of his friend just to get him off of his back because his friend, he, he considers, is pestering him. It, Ellen White continues, The lesson is drawn not by comparison, but by contrast. A selfish man will grant an urgent request in order to rid himself of one who disturbs his rest, but God delights to give. And Jesus used this method quite frequently. You know, he would do a comparison by way of contrast. Another example is in a parable that we studied during the Anchor School of Theology, the parable of the persistent widow. You know, there was this uh, unjust judge that uh, didn't uh, fear God or, or respect man. And uh, this widow kept on coming and coming and coming to him to ask him to do justice to her because the adversary had wiped her out when her husband had died. And uh, she kept on coming and coming until finally uh, the, the judge says, oh, I'm so sick and tired of having this lady come and beg that I do justice to her, so I'm going to answer her please just to get her off my back. Well, uh, the unjust judge is actually a symbol of God, but by way of contrast. Jesus is saying, if an unjust judge is willing to answer the pleas of this widow to get her off his back, how much more will God answer our pleas because he loves us? In other words, it's a comparison by way of contrast. So God is not like this individual in the parable uh, who uh, answers the pleas of his friend uh, because he wants to get him off of his back. Notice number five. Why does God impart so many blessings to us? Christ's Object Lessons 141. He gives to us that we may minister to others and thus become like himself. So God is our example. He gives to us so that we can minister to others and so we can be the same as he is who ministers to others. Number six, according to the Apostle Paul, what wise words did Jesus speak? And, uh, you know, this, these words are not registered in the Gospels. This is the recollection of the Apostle Paul about what Jesus said. And so we can trust that Jesus actually said it. What is it that Jesus said? The Apostle Paul in Acts 20 verse 35 spoke the following words. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. So Jesus spoke those words. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And of course, when we give, we also receive. We continue receiving. Number uh, seven. What enables us to receive an ever-constant supply of heavenly blessings? How can we be sure that we are continually receiving God's blessings? Well, you know, some people say, well, you know, you save up as much as you can. No, that's not the way. Notice the answer in Christ's Object Lessons, page 142. The capacity for receiving 
is preserved only by imparting. We cannot continue to receive heavenly treasure without communicating to those around us. You know, you can't fill a bottle that is full. You have to empty the bottle, and then the bottle has capacity to be filled again. And so it's only as we give that we have a capacity to receive. Let's go to number eight. What happens when we put the words of Jesus in Acts 20 verse 35 into practice? What happens? Well, Acts, uh, Luke 6 verse 38 gives us the answer. Give and it shall be given unto you. So give and you will receive is what this is saying. Give and and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. In other words, the more we give, the more we receive. The less we give, the less capacity we have to receive. So, and notice here it says that when we give, we receive good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. The more we give, the more we receive. That is a law of life. It's not like the man who built ever bigger barn. You know, he, uh, he, his barn was full of his goods. So he said, what am I going to do because my barn is full? He said, well, I'll build a bigger barn so that I have more capacity to store my goods. And he says, my goods. And so he builds a bigger barn. And that one fills up. And so he says, I need to build a bigger barn. So what he's doing is he's hoarding all of his stuff. Well, the word comes to him, this night your soul will be demanded from you. And so it is only as we give that we have a capacity to receive. And in giving, we are actually preparing to receive everlasting life. Now let's talk about the father who delights to hear. The Father who delights to hear. Of course, we're talking about our Heavenly Father. Number one, this is page 189. What did Jesus say about the solicitous generosity of a parent for his child? Uh, this, incidentally, is in the follow-up uh, teaching immediately after the parable. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will his father give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? And then Jesus provides a lesson. If ye then, being evil, know how to good, give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So, in other words, a parent is not going to give his child a stone, a serpent, and a scorpion because parents want the best for their children. And Jesus is saying our Heavenly Father is the same. Now let's read the note. Why did Jesus use a stone, a fish, and a scorpion in his illustration? Well, I've found that the best answer is in a book that was written by G. Christian Weiss. And uh, he wrote a very interesting book about uh, insights into Bible themes. And this would be page 16 of uh, his book. He explains why Jesus used a stone, a fish, and a scorpion in his illustration. The loaves of bread, familiar to the people to whom Jesus was speaking, were round, flattish, and rather dark in color. They were made of whole wheat or barley and were baked beside an oven fire in a brick oven. So, they, so basically they were brown and they were flat. Um, so once again, they were made of whole wheat or barley and were baked beside an open fire in a brick oven, often being covered with ash and cinders. Hence, they actually had very much the same appearance as an ordinary stone on the ground might have had. The comparison between a fish and a serpent is similar. There are certain types of slender, edible fish which closely resemble the deadly sea snake. But why would he associate an egg with a scorpion? This is also a vivid comparison. 
While many scorpions are dark in color, there is also in the Near East a light-colored variety, sometimes called the white scorpion. Though not snow white by any means, this creature, when curled up into its relaxed state, could be mistaken for an egg. So Jesus was taking things uh, that appeared like uh, other things, and he was making the comparison. Now we are on page 190, number 2. Why does God encourage us to address him as our Father? Christ's Object Lessons, page 141. In order to strengthen our confidence in God, Christ teaches us to address him by a new name, a name entwined with the dearest associations of the human heart. He gives us the privilege of calling the infinite God our Father. What a glorious privilege it is to call God our Heavenly Father. And of course, that was the favorite word that Jesus used to describe His relationship with God, His relationship with the Father. And of course, He taught in His prayer for us to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven. He didn't pray, Our Judge, who are in heaven. We are to perceive God as our Heavenly Father. Discipline, yes. Discipline comes with parenting. But Jesus wanted us to have the association of God as our loving Heavenly Father. Number three, how does the Father respond when we address Him as our Father? So when we address Him as our Father, how does the Father respond? Christ's Object Lessons, page 141. Spoken when asking His favor or blessing, it is as music in His ears. <laughs> That's amazing. When we address God as our Father, it's like music in the Father's ears. The statement continues, that we might not think it presumption to call Him by this name, He has repeated it again and again. He desires us to become familiar with the appellation. In other words, God wants us, He desires us to call Him Father. In fact, it is music to His ears, when he uh, hears us call him father. It's come, kind of like our children, when they uh, address us parents as father and mother, it makes us proud, it makes us happy. Number four, how does the love of our earthly parents toward their children compare with the love of God for his children? Christ's Object Lessons, page 142. Parents love their children. But the love of God is larger, broader, deeper than human love can possibly be. It is immeasurable. In other words, you can't measure the love of God. It's beyond measure. It's infinite. It has no beginning and it has no end. Okay, let's go to number five. Which three principles of prayer did Jesus teach uh, seek to teach through this parable? The answer is in Christ's Object Lessons, page 142. He shows that what is, he shows what is the true spirit of prayer. That's number one. He teaches the necessity of perseverance in presenting our request to God. That's number two. And assures us of his willingness to hear and answer prayer. That's number three. So number one, the right spirit. Number two, perseverance. And number three, we need to be sure that he's going to hear our prayer. Now, the next section deals with the purpose of prayer. What is the purpose of prayer? Let's go to number one. This is page 190 at the bottom of the page. Is prayer meant to change God's mind? You know, do we pray because we say, well, you know, if I pray hard enough, then God is going to change His plan for me. He's going to see my point of view. Well, let's notice Christ's Object Lessons, page 143. Prayer is not to work any change in God. It is to bring us into harmony with God. So in other words, the purpose of prayer is not to change God's mind. 
It is to bring us into harmony with God's will. Let's read the note where we have a little bigger explanation of this. Prayer is not sanctified arm twisting. It puts us in tune with the infinite will and wishes of our Heavenly Father. It blends our mind with His so that we are on the same page as He is. <clears throat> when we discern His will through prayer, we will understand that His ways are better than I weigh our ways and that His plans are wiser than our plans. So, in other words, the purpose of prayer is to put us in tune with what God's will is, not to get God to follow our will and our desires. Let's notice number two at the bottom of page 190. Why does God sometimes delay to answer our prayers? You know, uh, we usually think uh, that God can answer prayer only in two ways. That is, when we come to God and we make a request of God, uh, you know, God can answer yes and God can answer no. And of course, we always like the yes answer. But there's a third way in which God answers prayer, and that is by saying, wait. In other words, yes, no, or not now. Wait until it's the right time. Now, why does God sometimes delay in answering our prayers? Is it because He's not hearing us? It's because He doesn't want the best for us? Of course not. The answer is found in Christ's Object Lessons, page 143. When we make our request of Him, He may see that it is necessary for us to search our hearts and repent of sin. Therefore, He takes us through test and trial. He brings us through humiliation that we may see what hinders the working of His Holy Spirit through us. So notice that sometimes it's important for God to allow us to go through trial, through humiliation, and to remove what hinders us from working uh, in our lives according to His will. This reminds me of the story of the Canaanite woman who uh, had this uh, sick daughter, and she comes to Jesus. She says, please be merciful to me. Heal my daughter. And uh, Jesus just continues walking. He ignores her. And then, uh, you know, she continues uh, coming after Jesus. Please have mercy on me. And uh, the disciples tell Jesus in her hearing, you know, Lord, send her away. She's causing a, she's causing a scene. And uh, she hears what the disciples say, but she continues coming after Jesus. Uh, Lord, have mercy on me. Please heal my daughter. And then Jesus turns and he says, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, he seems to be saying, you know, I'm not sent to people like you, Gentiles from Canaan. Uh, but the woman, you know, uh, Jesus continues walking. The woman continues coming after him. Lord, please be merciful to me and to my daughter. And then Jesus, to cap it all off, says, it's not good to take the bread of the children and throw it to the dogs. Apparently, Jesus is calling her a dog. But Jesus was trying to make a point. And that is persistent, persistent faith in prayer. And so Jesus now says to this woman, O oh, woman, great is thy faith. And then he says, I have not found this kind of persistent faith in all of Israel. Now, let's notice uh, number three at the top of page 191. Will delay prove a benefit to those who will go through the time of Jacob's trouble? You know, there's this terrible time of trouble that is awaiting God's people. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. God's people will feel like they have been forsaken by God. Of course, God hasn't forsaken them. He promises to be with us till the end of the world. But they will feel forsaken, just like Jesus on the cross said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus felt forsaken, but he knew he wasn't because of the promises of God, because of God's word. God's people will go through a similar experience during the time of trouble. They will feel forsaken of God, but they will trust the promises of God that even though they can't feel God, God is there. We go by God's promises. We don't go by our feelings. So notice the answer in Great Controversy, page 630. Speaking about the delay in the time of trouble, the very delay so painful to them is the best answer to their petitions. As they endeavor to wait trustingly for the Lord to work, they are led to exercise faith, hope, 
patience, which have been too little exercised during the religious experience. So delay de develops faith, hope, and patience. In other words, dependence on God. It is a benefit to us sometimes for God to delay to answer us. Now let's notice the next section deals with conditions for answered prayer. God doesn't answer all prayers. There are conditions for Him to answer our prayers. What are some of those conditions? Number one, top of page 191. What must accompany prayer? Christ's Object Lessons 143. There are conditions to the fulfillment of God's promises, and prayer can never take the place of duty. In other words, you can pray and pray until you're blue in the face, but if you don't fulfill your duties, then God is not going to answer that prayer. Let's read the note, Steps to Christ 101. He who does nothing but pray will soon cease to pray, or his prayers will become a formal routine. So if people only pray and they don't fulfill God's plans, they don't fulfill the duties that God has given to them, eventually they will either cease to pray or their prayers will become a formal routine. Number two, are there conditions for receiving the Holy Spirit? Some people think the, the Holy Spirit will just come upon me if I ask. There's no conditions. The Bible says that there are conditions for receiving the Holy Spirit. Notice John 14, verses 15 and 16. If you love me, keep my commandments. So notice, Jesus is saying, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now, do you notice the sequence here? Jesus says, love me, keep the commandments, and as a result, I will pray to the Father, and so that the Father will give you the Holy Spirit. So there are conditions for receiving the Holy Spirit. Loving Jesus and keeping his commandments. Notice number three. What relationship is there between prayer and the observance of God's law? This is a powerful verse, Proverbs 28 and verse 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. So if you pray and you say, I don't have to keep God's law, the Bible tells us that that is an abomination. He who turns away his ear from hearing the law, his prayer is an abomination. In the note, Ellen White well remarked, prayer and effort, effort and prayer will be the business of your life. You must pray as though the efficiency and praise were all due to God and labor as though duty were all your own. So efficiency and praise belong to God, but labor and duty are our own responsibility, of course, through His power. Number four, how did the Apostle Peter underline the fact that obedience is necessary in order to receive the Holy Spirit? This is after the day of Pentecost. You know, Peter and John have gone through all sorts of trials for heal, healing a paralytic there at the entrance to the temple. Uh, they've been taken before the Sanhedrin. They've been uh, mistreated and beaten. And uh, they are told, don't continue preaching Jesus. And I want you to notice what they had to say. And we are his witnesses, that is Christ's witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey Him. So notice, the, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey the Lord. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray to the Father to give you the Holy Spirit. He who turns away his ear from hearing the law, his prayer is an abomination. And here we find that God gives His Spirit to those who obey Him. Never can you receive the Holy Spirit while willfully you are saying, I don't have to keep God's law. I don't have to keep God's commandments. Number five, at the bottom of page 191. What does Ellen White say regarding those who pray without regard to conditions? In other words, those who pray 
and don't meet the conditions for answered prayer. Here is the answer, Christ Object Lessons, page 143. Those who bring their petitions to God, claiming His promise, while they do not comply with the conditions, insult Jehovah. In fact, do you know what um, the sin of presumption is? The sin of presu presumption is claiming God's promises in disobedience. In other words, you think that you can disobey God and you can still claim His promises. Let me give you a couple of examples. Supposing that you haven't studied at all for a test and you get to the classroom and uh, the test is brought, it's placed before you, and you utter a prayer, you say, Oh Lord, please help me to pass this test. He's not going to answer that prayer because you did not meet the condition. The, the condition for receiving the blessing in the test is for you to study for the test. The same would be true with an individual who's going to go on a journey or on a trip, and he says to the Lord as he gets in the car and behind the wheel says, Oh Lord, please be with me as I go on this trip. Protect me from harm and danger. And then the person drives 120 miles an hour. You know, he's not meeting the conditions for answered prayer. So there are conditions to answered prayer. And by the way, um, the Satan came to Jesus and tempted him to be presumptuous uh, in the second temptation that is man mentioned in Matthew chapter 24. He said uh, to Jesus, you know, uh, here you are at the top of the temple tower, jump. And there's a promise in Psalm 91 that God is going to send his angels to take you in their arms before you hit the ground. And Jesus said, it is also written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. In fact, if I had time, I would show you that the devil only quoted a portion of Psalm 91, he left out one pray, phrase which would have totally changed the equation. So Satan tried to get Jesus to claim the promise of the Father's protection without meeting the condition for the promise. Now let's notice um, the next question. Actually, let's read the note under question number five. Only he who has true faith is secure against presumption. For presumption is Satan's counterfeit of faith. Faith claims God's promises and brings forth fruit in obedience. Presumption also claims the promises, but uses them as Satan did to excuse transgression. So presumption is claiming the promises of God in disobedience, whereas faith is claiming God's promises while we are being obedient. Let's go to number six at the top of page 192. Who only has the right to claim God's promises? The answer is in Christ's Object Lessons, page 145. All His gifts are promised on condition of obedience. All who obey Him may with confidence claim the fulfillment of His promises. So if you claim God's promises in disobedience, you are not going to receive a positive answer from the Lord because the Spirit is given to those who obey the Lord. If we love Him, we will keep His commandments and He will give us His Holy Spirit. Number seven, how can wounding others prove to be an obstacle to answered prayer? Christ's Object Lessons 144. If we have in any way grieved or wounded others, it is our duty to confess our fault and seek for reconciliation. This is an essential preparation that we may come before God in faith to ask His blessing. So we have to make things right with other people before we can pray and expect God to hear and answer our prayers. Number eight. Can unfaithful stewardship practices be a reason for unanswered prayer? In other words, can the use of the resources that God has given us be an obstacle for us to receive God's answers to our prayers? Christ's Object Lessons, page 144. Uh, here is the answer. If we are faithful stewards of earthly things, how can we, ex if, excuse me, if we are unfaithful stewards, of earthly things. How can we expect Him to entrust us with the things of heaven? 
It may be that here is the secret of unanswered prayer. So basically, if we're unfaithful stewards of earthly things, uh, God is not going to be able to trust us with the things of heaven. And then Ellen White says, perhaps this is the reason why our prayers are not answered. Now, the final section deals with persistence in prayer. This is the middle of page 192. Why does God sometimes delay to answer our prayers, and what should we do about it? Christ's Object Lessons 145. Often He delays to answer us in order to try our faith or test the genuineness of our desire. And then she counsels, unsw unswervingly persist in prayer. Number two, why do we sometimes not see more of the power of God in our lives? The answer is in Christ's Object Lessons, page 145. But many have not living faith. This is why they do not see more of the power of God. Their weakness is the result of their unbelief. And by the way, the word unbelief is the antonym of faith. Faith and unbelief. So many times God does not answer prayer. We don't see the power of God in our life when we ask because we don't have a living faith. We have unbelief, a lack of faith. And so we should ask the Lord to strengthen our faith. Number three, what will happen as a result of a faithful persistence in prayer? Christ's Object Lessons, page 146. The more earnestly and steadfastly we ask, the closer will be our spiritual union with Christ. We shall receive increased blessings because we have increased faith. So the question again is, what will happen as a result of a faithful persistence in prayer? And the answer is that we need to uh, more earnestly and steadfastly ask. This will unite us more and more with Christ in a closer relationship. And as a result, we will receive increased blessings because we have increased faith. Number four. Why should we not make it a habit to tell our difficulties to others? You know, some people love to tell all the trials and tribulations and temptations and difficulties that they have in their lives. They're always dwelling on the negative side of life. Why should we not be telling these things to other people and focusing on this? Christ's Object Lessons, page 146. The practice of telling our difficulties to others only makes us weak and brings no strength to them. It lays upon them the burden of our spiritual infirmities. In other words, it lays the burden on other people of our infirmities, which they cannot relieve. We can tell them about all these things, but they can't relieve the anguish that we're suffering. She continues, We seek the strength of erring, finite man when we might have the strength of the unerring, infinite God. So it's very important for us to lay our heavy burdens, our trials and tribulations, and our struggles before the Lord. Not uh, to human beings to have us help them, uh, to have them help us out of a difficult situation. We should recur to God Himself in prayer. Number five, how do our attitude and words affect our prayer life? The words we speak, would that affect our prayer life? Well, let's notice. By looking at appearances and complaining when difficulties and pressure come, you give evidence of a sickly, enfeebled faith. Talk and act as if your faith was invincible. You know, many people, in fact, uh, you know, I think it applies to everyone, are actually strengthened by what they say. In other words, words are not only expre an expression of what is in our mind and in our hearts, but words actually strengthen what is in our minds and is in our hearts. So we should utter words of faith. We should utter words of courage, words of hope, words of faith. And as a result, we ourselves will be impacted by our own words. Our faith will increase. 
So once again, by looking at appearances and complaining when difficulties and pressure come, we give evidence of a sickly and feeble faith. And then she counsels, talk and act as if your faith was invincible. We need to train ourselves to speak in a positive way words of faith. Now we are on page 193 as we near the end of our study, page 193. This is number six at the very top of the page. When God makes a promise in his word, can we be certain that it will be fulfilled? 1 John 5, 14 and 15 has the answer. If we ask anything, and now comes a key, a key concept. If we ask anything, according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So if we pray to the Lord and we say, your will be done, and we come in faith, we can be absolutely certain that God is going to answer our prayer. He might answer yes, he might answer no, this is not good for you, or he might answer wait. It's good for you to wait for a while. I have a plan. Just be patient. Number seven, what assurance can we have that God will hear our petitions when we come to him in the right spirit? So what assurance can we have? Christ's Object Lessons, page 148, has the answer. When we come to him, confessing our unworthiness and sin, he has pledged himself to give heed to our cry. Notice the condition. We come to him confessing our unworthiness and sin. He has pledged himself to give heed to our cry. And then comes this remarkable statement. The honor of his throne is staked for the fulfillment of his word unto us. So when God promises and we meet the conditions, and if God didn't keep his promise, that would be a reflection on his throne on his character, and God simply does not operate in that fashion. Now, let's notice question number eight. What attracts the interest of angels? Uh, We're going to dwell a little bit on this uh, particular question because uh, there's something uh, very important that we need to know about angels. So the answer is, what attracts the interest of the angels? The answer is this, when they, that is the angels, see one manifest Christ-like sympathy for the erring, they press to his side and bring to his remembrance words to speak that we will be as bread of life to the soul. So notice here in this statement, Christ's Object Lessons, page 148, that the angels bring words to speak to our remembrance, words to speak to other individuals. Now, God has a chain of command. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, we find that chain of command. The Father gives a message to His Son. The Son gives the message to the Holy Spirit. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The Spirit then gives the message to the angel. The angel then gives the message to John. John writes the message in a book. And he sends it to the churches, to the seven churches. And then God expects the seven churches to proclaim the message in the book to the entire world. In other words, God operates the universe by delegation. And the angels are the foot soldiers of the Holy Spirit, if you please. Now, I'm just going to mention these these, uh, passages in passing so that you see the importance of the angels in God's chain of command. In Luke 21, verses 14 and 15, we find a very interesting promise. Let's notice that, Luke 21 and verses 14 and 15. This is uh, the Olivet Discourse of Jesus that he gave on the Mount of Olives about the signs of his coming. Luke 21, 14 and 15 says, when we're taken before councils, what will happen? Um, It says there in verse 14, therefore... Settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom 
which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you the words to speak when you're taken before rulers and governors and they want you to give a reason for your faith. Now the parallel passage in Mark, Mark 13, expresses it a little bit differently. Mark chapter 13 and verse 11. It's the parallel passage, uh, but uh, it's expressed a little different. It doesn't say Jesus, it says uh, something else. Mark chapter 13 and verse 11. It says there, But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. So Jesus gives the words. The Holy Spirit gives the words. And according to what we just noticed in Christ's Object Lessons, page 148, it says, When the angels see one manifest Christ-like sympathy for the erring, they press to his side and bring to his remembrance words to speak that will be as bread of life to the soul. So in other words, uh, God and Christ and the Holy Spirit and the angels are all involved in the process of taking our prayers uh, and answering our prayers and providing us with the words that we need to speak to encourage other people. We receive and then we give. Finally, let's go to the last question that we find, and that's number nine on page 193 of our syllabus. What must we do before we work for others. There's a preparation that we need to do as individuals before we speak the words of God to others. Here is the answer. Personal effort for others should be preceded by much secret prayer. In other words, before we speak to others, there needs to be much secret prayer on our part. The statement continues. The reason why. For it requires great wisdom to understand the science of saving souls before communicating with men, commune with Christ. So in other words, before we can give to others, we must receive from Jesus. That's the title of our lesson, asking to give. As we receive more, we give more. And as we give more, we receive even more. Give and that will be given unto you. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus came as the Son of Man to give His life a ransom for many. So life is about giving, and in the process of giving, we are emptied of self, and then the vacuum that was left by self can be filled by God's Spirit. May God give us this experience in our prayer life and communion with Jesus.